Hey, we're live. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Stanford MLC Seminar Series. Um, this is episode seven. I'm Kron. We have with us Fyodor, Dan, Piero, and Matei, and our guest today, Matthias Polacek from uh, Amazon. Uh, so this week, we're going to be talking to Matthias about uh, Bayesian optimization and some of his experiences there um, in optimizing hyperparameters and other like scientific systems with, uh, with this technique. Um, as always, we, the plan is going to be the talk followed by podcast style discussion where you, the live audience, can ask questions. So there's a live chat where you can keep posting questions and we'll keep track of those questions and get them across to Matthias after his talk is over. Um, let me just quickly introduce Matthias. So Matthias is, uh, works at the intersection of machine learning and optimization. So he's a principal scientist at Amazon. He was previously also at Uber. He was a senior manager there. He founded Uber's Bayesian optimization team. So he's really an expert in this area and we're very excited to have him uh, today talk to us about scalable Bayesian optimization for industrial applications. So Matthias, take it away. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for the introduction. Um, great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Let me start by sharing my screen. Okay. okay. That works, I guess. That's great. Yeah. So welcome to the presentation. My name is Matthias Polochek. And as uh, Karen said, I'm a principal scientist at Amazon. Um, this talk is going to be, all, going to be about uh, scalable based optimization for industrial applications. I'd like to start a huge shout out um, to my former colleagues and collaborators at Uber, Uber AI. Um, the work I'm going to present would not have been possible without the support by the stakeholders and uh, the, other, the other teams. It's really a, a huge effort um, to pull this off that requires buy-in from all the different stakeholders. So um, the outline for the presentation, I'm going to start with an introduction to the problem. What is Bayesian optimization? Why do we care about that? And then we're going to share some takeaways from applying BaseOpt in practice, and then we're going to have a discussion. So what is BaseOpt? So BaseOpt is a method to optimize expensive functions. So our setting is um, we want to optimize the complex design X, and X is specified by D parameters. D is usually not more than 20, but recently we have been extending it a bit further um, to 100, uh, around 100, um, with a goal to optimize some objective function G. And this objective function G has certain properties. It's continuous, so the pose it does not jump, but it can be multimodal. So multimodal means there can be multiple local optima, and our goal is to find a global optimum. It's a black box function. So it means when you evaluate G of X, we get the function value. There may be noise, but there's no gradient. And we say it's an expensive function. So every function duration can take say half a minute, a uh, few hours, or in some settings in material science, for example, even days to weeks. So let me give you some examples um, of basic applications. We're gonna talk about today is uh, tuning the hyperparameters of machine learning algorithms and models. I mean, you think about a deep neural network, there's lots of parameters, right? There's all the different weights and biases. But we can actually tune those or train those using a backpropagation algorithm. So there's no use to um, apply base up for that. However, the training algorithm itself, Adam, for example, has certain hyperparameters. So for example, a learning rate um, or learning rate schedule, the mini batch size, top out. Um, and these parameters are important for the for the performance of the trained model. There are other hyperparameters that we can, may want to tune uh, jointly. For example, it is quite the architecture itself. So like the, the widths of the model, um, activation functions, number of layers, things like that. And how all said this overall setting works is that we actually choose a value of each of these hyperparameters. So we fix a learning rate, we fix a mini batch size, we fix a top out rate. Let me take a training set and we train the model. And that's an expensive function that can take several hours. In the end, we observe some performance, say a test error. And now the function we're going to optimize, or what we wish to optimize, is actually the function that matches, that, that maps a configuration of the um, training algorithm to a test performance. We want to find a configuration which has the best test performance. 
Another example is simulation optimization. That's definitely very relevant to practice. So often we build a simulation for um, a business use case. So for example, for a warehouse or for um, a traffic network, and we map or we, we, we fit this simulation to uh, real world data to make sure that actually the uh, behavior of the simulation matches our observations in the real world. And then we can use the simulation to optimize some policy. So for example, in traffic simulation, we may want to choose um, certain parameters or network to minimize congestion. So we can choose a policy and then we can um, evaluate this policy using a simulation. And this can take up to several hours based on the simulation that we have. And um, at the end, we get some output back. So it's a black box function in the sense that it matches, um, that it maps certain um, configuration parameters of a policy to some performance output. In a similar vein, a very um, important um, yeah, application in practice is control, where we have some policy and we can uh, optimize this policy either using um, real observations or some uh, simulations. One problem I've been working on in the past is actually design of dynamic structures. So here we have a design which describes, for example, the width of an airfoil or the length or um, the curvature of a wing. And then we can evaluate such a design using a CFD simulation. And such a simulation, for example, is, this, uh, is uh, developed at Stanford, it's your squared simulation. And it takes several hours to run on, um, on, a, on a cluster. So here our goal <coughs> would be to, to find the best setting of these decision variables to maximize the performance, for example, to uh, minimize the, 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 the track subject to some lift constraints. Another example is uh, material discovery. So I've been working on um, finding best solar cell material, PELS guides, and um, PELS guides are next generation solar cell material. So here the goal is to find um, a best molecule, this molecule is described by a central atom, say lead, by a halide, in this case iodide or a mix of halides, um, a cation or a mix of cations. And then we can either evaluate such a, such a configuration in um, a computation simulation, or we can send a person to the lab to evaluate this simulation, uh, this, this configuration by a real experiment. So in either of these cases, um, the function evaluation corresponds to some expensive simulation or some real experiment, and therefore it's costly. Bayesian optimization um, can solve these problems efficiently, and Bayesian optimization has two components. The first is so-called probabilistic model, and this probabilistic model uses data and Bayes theorem to compute the posterior distribution. The posterior distribution maps essentially um, for each x, it gives us for each x an estimate of g of x. And this estimate um, is here shown as a solid line. This is the mean performance, the expected performance. And it also provides a quantification of the uncertainty in these estimates. And this uh, uncertainty quantification, you can see it, uh, the two observations, the two black dots. Um, the uncertainty is small in areas that we have observed already. And it's large, it grows as we go away from, uh, from the observed points. The second component is so-called acquisition function. And this acquisition function allows us, uh, well, it helps us decide where to sample next. So it uses this uh, probabilistic model to make sure that we trade off exploration, exploitation, um, making sure we converge to a good solution overall by controlling the, um, uh, reduce the uncertainty globally in a, in a controlled way. The generic uh, Bayesian global acquisition algorithm um, looks as follows. It has a setup phase, and the setup phase, it collects data randomly, and then sets up a zero gate model. 
and that steps into optimization phase. In this optimization phase, um, we decide iteratively where to send the next using acquisition function, and we collect the observation, possibly with noise, and we update our surrogate model. And we iterate this process until we meet the stopping criterion. The stopping criterion, for example, could be um, number of samples or some predefined threshold that we want to meet. And then once we um, <clears throat> have met our stopping criterion, we recommend the best point. And um, in general, this is the point with the best estimated, best expected value under our most recent distribution, which means that if there's noise, then we recommend a point that performs best in expectation. Let me give an example what the space observation algorithm looks like in practice. So suppose you wish to minimize, and we have so far observed four points, um, around one point, minus 1.5 and minus 1, and plus 1 and plus 1.5. And you see the posterior distribution shown above. So you see the solid black line, which is the posterior mean. And you see the uncertainty qualification. You see the uncertainty is large in the center. That hasn't been sampled yet. And it's smaller in the areas around minus 1 and plus, uh, so minus 1 and plus 1, where we have sampled already. So now one strategy um, to solve this is the expected improvement criterion, where we say we wish to choose a point whose expected improvement over the best known solution is um, maximum, the expectation. So we can map this function. And we see that the expected improvement criterion takes large values between minus 1 and plus 1, and smaller values around minus 0.5 and uh, plus 1.5. And there's actually a reason for that. So when you look at this um, posterior distribution, and you see that the uncertainty, um, for example, looking around the point one, you see that the uncertainty for values a bit larger than point, that, that, that one is actually very small, right? You have several two points, the uncertainty is small, whereas left of uh, one, the uncertainty is larger. So when you look at the expected improvement plot down, uh, at the bottom, you see that the expected improvement criterion rewards points that have a low mean, which makes sense because we want to minimize, but also have uncertainty, right? So there's actually uncertainty gives this kind of room for improvement. And points that have both a low mean, we want to minimize, and sufficient posterior uncertainty, these are the points that are interesting under the expected improvement criterion. These are points we want, we want to sample. So we take the observation, um, which maximize, an X that maximizes the uh, expected improvement criterion. In this case, we got unlucky. We sampled a point that um, had worse performance. So we update our posterior. We recompute a maximum of the expected improvement criterion, and we sample again. So in this case, we sample around one, and we get a point that uh, is best, is better than the best known before, get a new optimum. Again, we update our posterior, we recompute the expected improvement criterion, find an optimizer, and we can do this in general using um, a gradient-based optimizer or genetic, al genetic algorithm to optimize this utility function. And we find an optimum of that, sample again, and unlucky this time, a good value, but not the best. And we keep iterating this process of updated posterior sampling again until we run our samples or then we found a point that is uh, good enough. Okay, that's a summary of um, base optimization. Let me share some takeaways from applying base optimization in practice. First of all, why is tuning machine learning models important in practice? Um, reason is machine models are really at the heart of many businesses, right? They predict supply, demand, conversion probabilities, travel times. And also most importantly, humans and machines make decisions based on the outputs of these machine learning models. So for example, it could help prevent fraud and keep users safe. However, what we find in practice that actually the performance of these machine learning models, meaning their accuracy or the classification error is highly sensitive to the configuration that is determined by the hyperparameters. So for example, initially we talked about Adam. If you choose Adam, 
Adam's parameters a bit differently during training, you can reduce your test error dramatically. Manual tuning of hyperparameters is expensive, and it's expensive in multiple ways. So on the one hand, it's time consuming. So it takes valuable time away from, from, research, from, from researchers, from data scientists, from engineers. Um, it's also frustrating and ineffective. And really the reason here is that the hyperparameters often interact. So when you choose one parameter a bit differently, you have to adapt the other parameters to that. Makes sense like learning rate, a mini batch size. Um, there are some interaction effects between these hyperparameters. And it's hard for humans to think in these higher dimensional spaces. So what people do in practice, sometimes they resort to grid search. Um, grid search has two problems. On the one hand, it's inefficient because it does not choose the points based on the value of the observation. The second is that actually can be good points in between. So we've seen that in the past, that actually good points are between the grid search points, and then we miss out on those. Another thing to keep in mind is actually that the um, number of tuning tasks can be much larger than number of models. So we can have basically many instances of the same model deployed um, for different areas, geographically, different time periods, and so on. There can be these specialized models, um, which increases the workload of tuning these models. Moreover, we see the signal actually changes. So the, the signal and the data changes with uh, seasons that affect human behavior demands. So the um, supply and demand can be affected. New products that are released um, may, may change the behavior. And also new policies of the company or even the competitors can affect the signal. In all these cases, we see that the performance actually degrades and we need to retune the machine learning model. Based optimization can in principle help with these tasks. So um, it can produce excellent configuration, relatively moderate human effort, and it's sample efficient in principle. However, in practice, um, there are a couple of caveats I would like to share. Um, when I started working on the space optimization service, I spent this a lot of time um, <clears throat> talking to the intended customers, the data scientists, engineers, stakeholders, in order to understand how would a base optimization service, a machine learning tuning, tuning service fit into their daily routine? What are the pain points it needs to solve? Um, how can it be accessible? It can become a productive part of the work environment. And the main takeaways I would like to share from these interviews and also lessons learned later during the process are the integration to workflows is really critical. Right? We need to pick up the users where they are. We need to be deeply integrated with the tools that they use for maintaining machine learning models, for um, training them. And also the infrastructure and engineering really critically impacts the performance. So um, there are aspects around scalability, parallelism, that has a huge impact on the user experience and the quality of the solutions. But overall, building such a, such, a, such a service requires a lot of ongoing collaboration and resources of partner teams. So at times there were 20 people involved in, in taking this off and only a small number was actually part of my team. Now, suppose you have built such a base optimization, base optimization service, that's great. Um, still, the adoption can be low because people may hesitate using it. Um, one reason I think is they tend to hesitate to use what they don't really feel familiar with, don't really understand. So people fall back to, to quit search in these kind of cases. It's easy to understand. So what we did actually was um, creating a one and a half day long base opt course. And um, in this base opt course, we provided some theory some science, um, but also some hands-on tasks, which people uh, had a chance to, for the first time, tune their own model uh, using these services we had provided, the interface we had provided. So they walked out of this course um, having a positive ex experience, having an understanding, and they start spreading the word to their colleague, and the colleagues that was actually very helpful. We also found that they raised awareness of stakeholders at a momentum. So the best stakeholders who said, well, look, my data scientists spend so much time to the machining models by hand. Um, if they can really done automatically, that would free them up to build better models, to feature engineering, think about new products and so on. So actually it helped a lot to get um, their buy-in and they essentially released in some internal policies of saying, hey, if you have a new model, make sure that you use the new base observers for that. 
So BaseOpt is pretty much plug and play from a scientific, scientist's perspective. In practice, things are a bit different. So there are certain design decisions to be made. For example, what is the search space um, for a parameter? Which parameters actually do we want to tune? Which parameters do we set to default values? Um, what is the right objective function? What kind of test error do we actually want to optimize? How do we choose our data set to make sure we get actually representative observations back? So there are a couple of things that um, we can, we should help the users making good decisions. And we, as a team, did that. We developed best practices. We developed robust default settings. And we spent lots of time with our partners uh, consulting internally for, for high profile business applications to help the partners make the best decisions. Another thing, um, we think of the space up service of sometimes it actually works in the background and as um, run on the weekends and in, in, at night. <clears throat> there are other use cases that are different. For example, model, model iteration. There was a, a, a use case that came up during interviews that people said, hey, I'm working on this model. Um, when I have a new, a new idea, uh, can we somehow fast tune this model so I get some representative results quickly? Next year, parallelism starts to work, it starts to matter. Can we actually use more resources in parallel to get some result, uh, say, before lunchtime? Another takeaway where I think the industrial practice differs a bit from uh, academic environment is actually um, how the quality of a return solution is evaluated. So in industry, the business value is usually associated with the good Y value. So really care about getting solutions that perform better on a Y axis. Whether or not it takes 10% more samples to get to the point Nobody really cares about that. Let's just compute. What we really want is uh, good solutions, higher accuracy, because they lead to better business decisions. Another thing to keep in mind, um, particularly with all this, as the base optimization service found more and more adoption, um, when there are thousands of machine learning models that are tuned, periodically retuned, then the amortized sample efficiency starts to matter. I mean, even companies have limited resources it comes down to model tuning. And so we started using ideas like warm starting base opt, meta learning, and also some domain specific uh, shortcuts like grouping models together um, to somehow keep this uh, overall co compute task uh, manageable in practice. So it's a, it's a mixture of principled ideas and uh, pragmatic hands on solutions. And overall, I think that's actually a very interesting idea for future research that I have not seen um, being studied much. Talking about basic research, one shout out, I think basic research also has proven valuable in the process. Basic research has lots of, has lots of advantages, um, like uh, yeah, public good, um, hiring, outreach, and so on, but also has some value direct for the business application. I'd like to shout out though that the first release of the service was actually pretty unexciting from a scientific point of view. So really went with a very, very basic vanilla version of base optimization. And the reason was that uh, pulling this off the ground required lots of collaboration between partners of different orgs. There were timelines, there were other dependencies. So I decided I should take the methodology out of the equation. I said, okay, let's not worry about whether the science part works. Let's stick to what we know. Um, and let's focus on all the other aspects, administrative or authoritarian aspects to, to realize this. I think it was important to shorten the, the time to get the first prototype of the service out, which was a quick win that reassured the different partners that actually the investments are worth the time and the efforts, and also allowed us to get quick user feedback. So we, we saw where the pain points were, we saw how much we could address them. And then later on, um, we actually started working on uh, more advanced base up techniques. So one thing I saw uh, that actually for, for companies, they can invest thousands of samples into an expensive black box function if the business value is big enough, right? The lever is big enough, then they take uh, what it needs to optimize that function. So there was actually a need for large budgets. There was not much work at the time. So I was working with, with my team on this large scale high dimension base up setting. And we got uh, two papers out of that. Um, one has been accepted in Europe last year, and one is uh, currently under review. 
one thing that came out of all these space op courses was that people actually started seeing use cases of base optimization that we did not anticipate. So the service was used for different optimization tasks that actually we had, had planned originally. And I think developing a solution that is principled, it's a, an algorithm that really solves the class of problems, um, led to a version or led to, led, led to a service that was robust for these future use cases, right? It generalized better than um, a version by have that have been just targeted on machine learning models, tuning machine learning models. One thing I should shout out here, I really think that the um, one important aspect was to start with the users, start with their pain points, but then also when evaluating these, 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 uh, uh, these methods that we developed, to evaluate, evaluate them on uh, actual business use cases. So if there's one thing um, if it works for classifying cats and dogs, but in practice must work on the respective uh, data sets and the business use cases. So collecting these early on in the process was definitely helpful for us. Summing up, um, base optimization is uh, definitely a simple, efficient uh, optimization method for black box function. There are others. Um, base optimization has a speciality that it has a zero gate model that provides estimates of the mean and also some uncertainty quantification and confidence estimates of this uh, of these estimates. Um, there's an acquisition function that uses the zero gate model to decide where to sample next and therefore trades of exploration exploitation. We talked about Bayesian optimization being a valuable tool to tune machine learning models in practice. Um, as I said, this the key one key um, aspect for tackling this problem was in my eyes to start with the users and evaluate on relevant business use cases that make sure the performance uh, excels there. Um, integration into the workflow systems was important, but also the education of users, making them aware of the uh, options that such a, such a base of service provides and how to use it, uh, that was very valuable too. And so as we think of base optimization typically as um, a method that easily allows us to take the human out of the loop, uh, within practice, there is some work necessary to actually help the user along to guide the hand. Um, it's not as plug and play as uh, we may think from an academic perspective. One value that Bayesian optimization has, particularly because it has a surrogate model, is that Bayesian optimization actually is extensible. So just want to showcase some work uh, I've done in the past. Um, one aspect is actually multiple, or one, one work is around using multiple information sources, where the idea is there's not just a black box function, there are also approximations. Like for example, when you have a simulation, you can have uh, different fidelities. And you can use Bayesian optimization to make principal decisions, which fidelity to leverage in order to find um, a good solution at lower, uh, lower overall, overall cost. In some settings, the black box function actually is not really a black box function. We can get the gradient, or at least some different information. Um, and this tends to maybe still be valuable to use Bayesian optimization if the function is multimodal. So we've done some work in that area. Another interesting direction of work is actually optimization of uh, combinatorial structures. And here the idea is, what can we do if the decision variables are not continuous, not optimizing over some hyper-rectangular, but actually optimizing over decision variables that are binary, for example. And I think that's an interesting direction to go. Um, there has been some follow-up work, but I think there's definitely much more work to be done. And overall, the last aspect is maybe even the most important I think this black box setting is often too restrictive. So in many cases, like in simulation optimization, we can actually look inside the black box. We can look into the simulation and we can see where are pain points, where's congestion, um, which items run out of stock quickly and so on. And we can use these to optimize our uh, policies more efficiently. So getting to start it in this, uh, and similar for material, material science applications, maybe simulations, so getting more like finding better ways to leverage the additional information. Um, I think that's a very valuable direction for future research. 
that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Matisse. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for giving us a sort of introductory overview as well. I think that was really uh, great. So just a reminder to the audience, um, you can ask questions in the chat and I think a few questions came in while you were uh, speaking. I can get us started. Um, so I think like one thing that um, I'm curious about as well is just where Bayesian optimization is at in, uh, in today, like in terms of just the uh, types of tools available. So when I was in uh, my master's in 2016, Yelp had this library called MOE. I don't know if it's still around, but I, I did some research in uh, BO and, and I had mixed experiences, let's say, uh, comparing to random search and things like that. So I'm just curious in terms of just like um, the ability to scale gracefully with dimensionality of your domain, for example, and things like that. Are, do, are there good tools now that are available um, yeah, that people can just use? Yeah, this MOE tool actually has involved in, has been uh, taken on by Peter Fraser's group at Cornell, now Cornell Mo. Um, there are other tools out there. I mean, there's, there's Bowtorch by, by Facebook team, for example. There is uh, Dragonfly from CMU. Um, Fine Cutter School in Freiburg also has a, has a tool available. There's a large variety of tools. Um, when it comes down to scalability, I think from a basic perspective, the tools are pretty much comparable. Um, scaling to large numbers of decision variables, that's really an area of active research these days. I think then if you're interested in this kind of work, then you, I would recommend looking at some recent developments, recent um, publications. And for example, my team has published the Turbo algorithm, those codes available for uh, academic purposes. I actually have a follow up on this, Matthias. Um, I know of your work on the you know, uh, multiple, um, um, on, on, uh, on spaces that are like discrete spaces rather than continuous spaces. And can you comment on that specifically in terms of, uh, with respect to hyperparameter optimization, like um, is there, um, one, one of the limitations of some of those packages that Karan was talking about is the fact that they only accept um, continuous uh, values as inputs. But when you're uh, optimizing some hyperparameters of a machine learning model, some of those are actually not continuous. And so um, I, know, I know you've done the work on that. So I'm curious of your take on, on this aspect. Yeah, I think there are different approaches to that. So I think one is to use a specialized algorithm like the box algorithm that we developed. Um, there was follow-up work by Max Welling and Andreas Krause that have improved on that. So such a specific algorithmic implementation um, may lead you to better results, I guess, if you if you have the time to customize that, get it up to work. I know that the uh, state-of-the-art packages like Bowtorch actually allow you to specialize, uh, to, to define um, the parameter values, a range of a parameter. So there's this X component for Bowtorch and you can, um, use specific encodings. I think there's some internal mapping still happening. So it's still mapping everything to continuous space eventually, um, which may or may not result in a, in a slightly worse performance in a specialized solution. But I guess for practical purposes, that's probably the, the best way to get a, to a good solution quickly. Hey, Matthias, I'm curious about a phrase that you had uh, near the end of your slides about taking the human out of the loop. Um, and I was just kind of uh, wondering what you thought about, you know, what steps in the pipeline do, do you think that that should be one of the goal, uh, one of the goals? Because uh, I think right after that, you mentioned that you wanted to break open the black box and there may be um, some places where uh, there, you might have like other priors about what good parameters are. And to me, that seems like a place where you want the human in the loop to kind of give you some of that insight. Um, wondering what your thoughts of about kind of that uh, interplay between you know, stuff that might be in somebody's head versus just trying to use some automated process to, to discover it all on your own? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, base, of, base optimization and the basic methods always uh, come with a promise that you can include priors. Um, in practice, it's not as easy as you said. So we often used human uh, insights, in domain expertise, in, for example, narrowing down the search space, um, focusing on the area of interest for different parameters, saying, okay, this parameter, we should probably optimize in that range, the parameter should be optimized in that range. Um, <clears throat> so 
thinking about this, uh, this sim simulation optimization, gray box setting, um, the idea was a little bit different. So I think the idea there is really to say, there's a lot of information inside the simulation um, that, is, that is not used currently if we only focus on the one output scalar or output vector of the business metric we care about. But if you actually look inside the box um, and supposing the, that the simulation is modeling some real world process, for example, um, we can, if, if we can pull out this information um, in order to guide us to get to a good solution quicker, then we can, um, we use actually the, we use the domain expertise that was uh, used to build the simulation itself, but we don't need to use the uh, simulation, we don't need, don't need to use um, domain expertise for um, the base optimization process itself. So it's, it's a quite different approach. The approach is really to say, so much effort has been put into using the simulation, building the simulation, the simulation is fit to real world data. Um, it somehow models these processes. Let's get more out of that than just one quantity in the end. Interesting. So less, less so, uh, so, so more so taking something that you know from, uh, from the actual thing that you're optimizing and trying to use that in the process. Yeah, for example, if it's a warehouse simulation, right? And we can look at the uh, business value at the end of the day, how good does that policy that maintained our warehouse has worked but if we know well, the simulation actually models demand, it models supply, it models arrival times, um, all these distributions are fit to real world data. Um, then we can look inside and see, hey, actually, maybe these items run out of stock quickly. So maybe we should actually increase our supply for those. Um, and this would not be reflected in this one business value coming out at the very end of the simulation process, but actually information is all there. You just need to pull it out. Right. Um, the, the, the phrase, uh, taking the human out of the loop, actually refers to a very influential paper that Ryan Adams and his co-authors uh, wrote a couple of years ago, which he said, okay, let's take the human out of the loop, let's make uh, model tuning plug and play. And I think the methodology itself, uh, once the data pipelines and the workflows, everything is set up, it's pretty much plug and play, but it still needs some expertise to set it up right in the beginning to make the right decisions. Um, to make sure we get a good solution afterwards. And sometimes it's as simple as um, what actually is our training data? How do we choose our training data? How do we choose our test data to ensure that the performance actually is um, representative? So if there are some kind of trends, periodicities, um, then the training data should reflect that, but it should be large enough, spend large enough the horizon um, to ensure a reliable result. Gotcha. So actually, so speaking about the, uh, the the simulations that you talked about earlier, I had a follow up question actually. So um, at the beginning of the presentation, you gave all these other examples of optimization problems, like simulations, or uh, I thought the picture of the, the the six quadcopter thing. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Um, so uh, so how well do you think that the lessons that you've identified through through your work applying Bayesian optimization to uh, hyperparameter tuning, how well do you think those lessons kind of apply to those other fields or um, do, do they kind of change in different ways? Yeah, I think some, um, I think one of the lessons that we saw is that actually choosing a search space, right? Why um, some kind of guidance, how to encode parameters, for example, if it's a parameter varies between say close to zero at one, and then one might, might want to encode it in a specific way. Um, some of these lessons, I think they are not bound to the specific task of tuning machine learning models. That's something which is valuable for other users, right? I think as a provider of a software package that um, provides base optimization methodology for, for end users, I think, yeah, <clears throat> Provide some kind of templates, for example, or even raising the awareness that these are set parameters that are to be set carefully is helpful. I think one difference between this application I mentioned in the beginning, where uh, we are working on some uh, research project, is that there's really just this uh, very specialized application um, searching for one dis yeah, aerospace design or searching for one. Um, but yeah, new material is a bit different from the 
industrial setting where we have a large variety, there's a large, large variety of different tasks. And I uh, want to make sure that uh, the settings we provide work well for, for all the customers. Right, so there's a different um, a bit different touch to that. We cannot be as specialized um, as in as in the other case. I guess because in general, so in general, there's also I think there's a, there's a trade-off in practice between providing a setting that works well overall for a large number of different use cases, and then really going deep with a high profile or high high business value partner and really getting the maximum out of that. Of the system for this particular use case, which may require you know, revisiting the objective function and so on. There's one a set of questions that are coming from some of our viewers. Um, there are two points that, for instance, Pat um, is raising that I'm curious about. Uh, one is um, if you can comment on the you know the sample efficiency. You know, the, usually what are the ranges of sample efficiency? Uh, how much can you? improve sample efficiencies, in particular for upper parameter optimization, but in general, with respect to other algorithms. And the other aspect is, and I'm actually curious about this, is he is familiar with um, empirical optimization, like the stage algorithm, for instance, and he wants to understand like what is, um, what are the comparisons, if, if any, with Bayesian optimization algorithm. Well, regarding sample efficiency, um, that's actually a question that comes up often in practice. How many samples do you have to use? How many function variations do you have to use or to get to a good solution? Um, the general answer is difficult, right? So in general, um, it's hard to say how complex the actual optimization task is because if the objective function is some uh, abstract construct that maps configurations to some test performance, right? Who knows what this looks like? Who knows how smooth this function is and so on? These are really the parameters that, that um, determine the number of steps that we need. So what we do in practice is usually something like make sure we err on the side of using too many samples because it's just compute. Um, frequently, we have these kind of use cases where we do some kind of one-off study with uh, partners in order to see, hey, how many samples actually necessary to tune a model like this for that use case. And then afterwards, for all the recurring studies um, that provide the, the bulk of, uh, of compute cost we use these kind of settings we have found on the first um, pilot study. It was like a practical trade-off. Um, the stage algorithm, I'm not familiar with it. I'm sorry. I mean, in general, I would say competitors or other methods out there are definitely um, genetic algorithms. They often provide good performances, and we have compared to those, for example, in our Turbo work, in your 2019 work. Um, and there are also methods from uh, related fields engineering like Kubala <clears throat> that also are very effective um, efficient black box optimizers. One value as I said in the end, one value is seeing phase optimization is this uh, probabilistic model which allows us to include more information and therefore go to settings like multi-modality, uh, gradient phase optimization uh, and so on. Yeah, I can imagine that in particular as compared to um genetic algorithms and population-based methods, the trade-offs are different, right? Because it depends on how long does it take to evaluate the function as opposed to how long does it take to actually compute an example, right? And so you have a, a different different, um, uh, different trade-offs there, right? Right, so I'll say that's why the, the overall assumptions, the function must be expensive enough. So it actually justifies this overhead that we carry along. I think that's a good point. Matthias, uh, I have a question about, I think it ties into the warm start Bayes optimization scenario you mentioned. So if we're tuning the same model across different data sets, um, say, you know, nighttime, daytime, or like the four seasons, um, that they share a physical model. So one could imagine that the values that um, we sample will be correlated along, uh, among all these environments. Uh, how is it possible to take these correlations into account uh, to improve the sample efficiency? Yeah, that's a great point, exactly. That's a, that's a key idea of this warm starting paper that we wrote a while ago. That we actually learn this covariant structure between periods. Um, so this probabilistic problem, problem model can be set up so that they actually, the time, for example, is one dimension. And you can see this sample of these, these performance observations across time 
um, for different configurations and you learn the covariance structure. Um, so when you actually start off with a new um, with a new task, you have all information from the past and using information from the past that you can actually get for your new uh, optimization task is something like an improved prior. So you, from the past, you know how configurations have performed in the past, but there's uncertainty, right? Because it's a new task. So the uncertainty is not zero, it's non-zero, but the amount of the quantifications that you've done by the, by the probabilistic model. And we see that definitely helps a lot um, in cutting the cost, say, uh, factor 10. Um, so that's an, that's an important uh, you know, method or cornerstone of actually scaling up um, the base integration service to, to industrial scale. Um, just kind of in this vein of uh, applying uh, vision optimization in practice, I think one question that came in the chat, which uh, was interesting was, uh, what were some of the primary pain points that you encountered when um, you were doing your course and, and you were trying to understand how uh, people actually interact and what problems they run into when you're doing vision optimization? So I can imagine like uh, following on from what Dan was saying, like there's also a lot of uh, stuff related to like kernel design or things like that, right? And, and all of those involve a lot of like know-how about the domain and, and so on. So are there kind of, maybe you can point to like particular like success stories or an example where, where this was kind of uh, something that, that went through very well? I mean, one pain point to be, or one, you know, one obstacle we encountered frequently was that uh, users had no mindset of quit search. So they actually defined base and optimization uh, the the search space of base optimization as a couple of points. Um, so rather than actually defining for the relevant parameters an interval that you want to search over, they just gave us like three different values. And then the overall, this, they spent uh, a search space which had like, say, 10 different solutions. Um, and then they used 100 samples and there was a lot of frustration that the um, best solution was found after three steps and afterwards there was no progress. Which comes from this uh, expert experience uh, of using quit search, and um, essentially it's a was on us. Right? We did not communicate it properly how to use this and by setting up these templates, um, giving robust uh, recommendations for, for for these choices. It makes it made it much better. What kind of users did you have in this setting? So that was actually users all across the board: data scientists, engineers. Um, the ownership depends on the team, essentially. I think that's it. And people have different backgrounds. I mean, they have background machine learning, operations research, and so on, statistics. Um, I think base optimization is not necessarily taught in grad school, right? It's, uh, it's been around in the 90s, but it really has been taken up um, over the last couple of years. I think the next generation probably have learned about this in school. I mean, I guess one, one thing that I think a lot of people are always curious about is setup cost. Um, so if you're, if you're, if you already have a problem and, and you're doing grid search or you're doing one of these like standard solutions, um, could you comment a little bit about what are some of the steps that people need to do to be kind of more um, systematic in, in doing vision optimization? What is that setup cost and how do you really kind of set it up in a way Way that it's kind of more circumspect, you, you actually expect it to succeed. Because this was one of the things that I al also had an issue with. I was working on education problems where you're looking for tutoring policies. And there was a lot of like domain expertise there. And it was hard to translate that into, uh, into the Bayesian optimization side, you know, like designing the kernel, setting up the space where you need to do search, the prior, things like that, even like small parameters there. So are there kind of things that you've learned along the way that helped there? So really, we really tried to, try to take this setup cost on us. Right? That was really our, our approach was to say, um, once the user um, opens up their respective workflow tool, they see the machine learning model, um, they set up how to train it, the cadence for training, then basically tuning it should just be one more click. Right? And then one, with one more click, um, they could either use the default settings or they can go into the advanced settings and they can choose additional um, parameters. But really, making this additional cost as small as possible. I think that's a critical part for, um, for the adoption. <clears throat> in order to make this work, it was, again, the, the work, uh, the, the, the cost was on us to actually pulling data sets, um, seeing 
how do default settings work with different data sets and then converge it to something that works pretty much across the board for important use cases. Um, other than that, I think the when I think about this, the, the uh, scenario of a grad student that has developed a model and wants to wants to tune this model, um, ideally, it's uh, really just a uh, couple of steps to include um, visualization service into the existing workflow. In practice, it can be harder, right? I mean, it depends on how big the data sets are and so on. Um, in order to make this scalable in practice, I think a lot of work, a lot of hard engineering work actually went into um, maintaining scalability. So as the data sets get large, as the number of jobs get large, as the number of um, samples get large, make sure we um, yeah, maintain a, a moderate computation of cost that the teams could, could, could handle the budgets. That was a, a big part. So speaking of uh, scalability and kind of the differences, you know, between a grad student tuning their models versus um, a, a, a large corporation, uh, I think one of the things that people think about when they hear the word scalability is uh, parallelism, like scaling out to many, many machines. Um, and the algorithm that I think you described at the beginning of the talk seemed very sequential. Um, so I wonder, uh, have you done work in thinking about when can you parallelize, like maybe a, we'll shoot off like five different things across the search space um, or, or any things like that? Yeah, absolutely. There was actually a requirement or a request that came up in, this, in the interviews and people asked for, for, for small ball club times. The only way to achieve that um, is actually to, to batch the uh, function relations, batch the one training, which means that the algorithm needs to be able to suggest not one point to sample next, but k points, where k can be 10, 20, 50. Um, the problem with that is the, often for many acquisition functions, the cost, the overhead of deciding these 10 points or 20 points um, becomes large, right? So actually there's a cost involved in that. It's a, it's a more complex problem to choose 20 points in a coordinate fashion than just choosing one. Um, the other thing is that in principle, the problem is sequential decisions, sequential variations are probably more effective, right? Because you leverage always the newest posterior, so you could probably get away with a small number of separates. So what we did actually was we used Thompson sampling, which is an algorithm um, that is very easy to parallelize. Um, for those who don't know Thompson sampling, Thompson sampling idea is essentially to draw a realization of this unknown function, which actually means like one potential uh, optimization surface find an optimum of that, of that realization and sample there. And that's something that can be paralyzed very easily. Surprising thing is that um, as long as there's a lot of uncertainty where good solutions are, the Thompson sampling algorithm actually would uh, recommend good solutions, uh, good, good sample points. Um, and so we did that to uh, meet these requirements. And we saw that actually the uh, cost of uh, paralyzing these decisions, um, the, the additional overhead of sampling was relatively small. And so Matthias, there, I think, again, there's, there's, there's a trade-off, right? You, you are using Thompson sampling instead of regular sampling and sampling and, and you're obtaining, you're parallelizing. So maybe your samples are worse, but your, your, your clock, uh, your, your world clock time is faster, but maybe you need to sample more. Um, what's your suggestion there? Should we, is there like a, a, a trade-off, like parallelizing more than a certain amount, then it becomes random search basically and before that amount, it, it, is there a good spot there to, to look for? Yeah, it's, it's really hard to make a recommendation that works for, fits all settings, it works for all settings. Um, it's, it, it's, it's really a trade-off and it depends on the but, sample budget that you have. But if you just have 20 function relations available, um, then batching to up like five or 10 probably doesn't, doesn't work that much. But even then actually, it's, we had situations in the past where we had severe latency requirements, which so we just could afford a small number of rounds of function evaluations. Um, so then it was clear we could not use much information for previous rounds just because there were very not many rounds. So which we scaled up, we took the uh, potential risk of actually making inefficient um, function, function evaluations 
just to make sure we get to a good solution after a couple of hours, so maybe right on that side. Um, but it's, it's really hard to make a general statement for a large variety of, of use cases. And again, on the, um, uh, let's say, uh, trying to make the process faster, more parallelizable, and you know, better use of resources in general, what is your take on um, approaches that you know, um, do kind of early stopping or resuming of training or uh, like hyperband things? Like, what, what's your take on this kind of setting? Yeah, definitely. I mean, th that's something around, for example, like fidelity, hyperband. Um, these are methods that can reduce the overall cost. Um, yeah, say to by, by a certain factor. Not to say, it's hard to say how much, maybe factor three, factor four, factor five. Um, it's not enough to uh, scale an approach to thousands of models if the really, that doesn't cut it all the way. Um, but it can be an important ingredient um, in, in scaling the method up to, to industrial scale. So for example, we talk about um, tuning machine learning models where uh, each, each training of the deep network takes whatever 15 hours. Then it can be useful to, to use this kind of methods that essentially allow us to stop prematurely um, those runs that don't work very well and focus on those that work better. So it can be, it can be a cornerstone in, in my eyes, can be an ingredient uh, to, to scaling up, but it uh, alone doesn't do it. So there's still engineering and so on to actually get us to the point. So uh, one, one, maybe uh, we have like three or four minutes. So maybe one qu a quick question about uh, what you're excited to see next in, in this area and, and in general, like some of the work that you're doing now in terms of cutting edge research and so on. I th think you mentioned your uh, NURBS submission or, or some submissions or NURBS paper last year and some submission this year. So uh, just curious about where BIO is going and what we can expect. Um, especially what like on the research side, but also like as consumers, like uh, companies, what kind of uh, technology can you expect in the next three to five years, do you think? I mean, it's been super exciting in the last couple of years in Bayesop to see how fast the community has grown, how many interesting new ideas have come out there. Um, I personally got into the field because I was really excited about the immediate impact, even in academic setting, based on relation can have to actually really help people working in material science, people working in aerospace um, with the daily problems, right? You can really help them. Um, and I think these kind of applications that worked in seeing there currently, uh, that's super exciting. I think there are interesting connections to gene-based innovation and um, reinforcement learning and so on. I think that's, uh, I'm curious what comes next. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, uh, we want to thank you, of course, for taking a time out um, and giving us a great talk and a lot of insight into uh, how Bayesian optimization can be used well. Uh, I want to thank our audience as well for tuning in this week. Um, please visit our website, mlsys.stanford.edu, if you want to see the schedule and previous talks if you've missed them, and subscribe to our mailing list. There's a link there. Um, also, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Um, keep, if you want to keep growing the channel and continue this, uh, this kind of uh, effort in MLSYS and keep inviting great speakers. Um, next week, we're going to have Kayvon Fadahalian from Stanford. Uh, we have a new time next week. It's going to be at 1 p.m. Pacific. Um, we'll, if you're on the mailing list, we'll send that out um, and we'll also post on social media. But um, he was, he's going to be talking a little bit about video analysis. So something uh, a little different from what we've had before. Uh, video analysis uh, at, at, at scale and at speed. Um, and that's going to be the last um, episode of uh, this year. And then we're going to come back again in January uh, to do some more. And we'll, we'll keep you posted on what we have planned for next year. So thanks so much, everyone. Uh, let's say bye to the audience. And Thank you. Thanks.